let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's 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 go. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Are you ready to praise? Cause I'm ready to praise. Yo, here we go. One, two, three, let's get it. Welcome to Tunbridge Wells Baptist Church online. Thank you for joining us, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube and whatever time of day it is, and maybe you're in a different part of the world. It's good for you to join us. We spoke to one of our uh, church family members who lives a large proportion of time in America. And she said during the week that when she woke up, it was minus 11. That's pretty oh. chilly, isn't it, Duncan? <laughs> Hello, Duncan, by the way. It's really good to see you. It's lovely to be here. 
So I expect Susie in America is having a proper winter, but you know, if that happened to us in Tunbridge Wells, we'd probably be like, whoo, that's a bit, a bit much really, isn't it? So Duncan, this week, what are you going to be sharing with us on later on? Well, I think we all need a little bit of encouragement at the moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also we need to be encouraging others yeah. uh, at, at, at this time. So we'll be looking at receiving and giving encouragement. Fantastic. That would be really good to hear. We can all do with encouragement, as you say. Now, I was listening to Classic FM in the car the other day, and I heard one of the presenters talking about um, a story that he'd heard on, uh, read on Facebook by uh, Russell James, who I think is the Welsh actor and a musician. But the story wasn't about him, it was about his dog. One thing about Russell Jones was that he had broken his leg. So he had it up and there we go. But Russell Jones was talking about the fact that he had just spent 300 pounds on vet's fees for his dog. Now it appeared that his dog was very unwell and his leg in particular. He was limping and there seemed to be all kinds of things wrong with his dog. But the vet, taking x-rays and checked out, ran loads of tests, could not find anything wrong with his dog. In the end, the vet turned around and said to Russell, your dog is copying you. 300 pounds for a sympathetic dog. Mm, poor Russell. But it got me thinking, how often do we copy God? I mean, if someone's, how much time other people spend with us, do they see that we are copying God, that we are imitating God in the way that we are around the people at home with us at the moment, the way we speak to people, perhaps thinking about encouragement, you know, are we going to be encouraging each other? Because that's what uh, God would want us to do, isn't it? And a chap called Va Vance Han Hanfner, tricky name, he said this, a Christian should not be a question mark for God, but an exclamation point. I thought that was quite a good quote. Now, we can learn from the New Testament, and Paul wrote about this in Thessalonica, when he was writing to the Thessalonians. He said that we should become imitators of them and of the Lord, because they welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. So the Thessalonians had heard and experienced the good news of Jesus as their saviour. And they complimented him by they were imitating Christ. So for us today, let's be imitators of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some of you may have been aware that this week it was Holocaust Memorial Day. It's a day, it's a bit like Remembrance Day, where we remember those who were lost or have been their lives affected by those from the Holocaust from the Nazi regime in the Second World War. And then also uh, for those who've been impacted by the genocides since then, in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur, to name some of the things that have happened. So if you're interested in finding out more, go on to the Holocaust Memorial Day website. But the theme for this year is Be Light in the Darkness. And that's a great mm. encouragement for us all, isn't it? And I was thinking, as if we're being imitators of our Lord Jesus Christ, then he is the true light of the world. And we can imitate him by being light to the world around us. Because our world, there is such darkness in, at times, isn't there? So let's point to Jesus, the true light of the world, as we imitate him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather together remotely today, whatever time of the day it is, Lord, we thank you that you are in every home by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we are here to worship you. We're here to bow down. You are the light of the world. You step down into darkness so that we could have our eyes opened to see you and the hope of a life spent with you. Lord, may we be imitators of you, Lord Jesus, with the people around us at home or the people that we meet close to us. Lord, wherever we are, may we point to you as the true light of the world. Amen. Amen. We're now going to hand over to our worship team for our time of song worship together.
in the trial and the change this one thing remains this one thing this one thing he is higher than the mountains that I face Yeah. 
never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love, your love, your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Thank you, team. It's really great to see lots of different people uh, each week worshipping God and leading us in our song worship. It's brilliant to see you all. So after Church Online, we're going to have our Zoom chat, and the link will have been sent to you in our newsletter this week. So grab yourself a drink uh, and maybe a biscuit, and it'll be really good to join together and catch up. Now, Duncan, you wanted to share something about prayer. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Um, the, both the Archbishops of Canterbury and York have been encouraged us through the, the whole of February to pray. So we've been thinking, well, how can we pray? And so just a couple of thoughts to, to suggest to everyone, and, and you need to find your own rhythm and, and way of doing it, is that I would suggest maybe we could pray once a day. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, they are recommending 6 p.m. I, I recognize that's not the most convenient time, mm -hmm. but to pray for our nation. And as we pray for our nation, why don't we pray for the things that we are aware of? We know we've lost 100,000 people. Therefore, we know there's lots of bereaved families and friends. Mm -hmm. We know, don't we, uh, about uh, the school's going to continue uh, not having the children back. So we can pray for not only the children, but also the parents who are trying to help them to home learn, as well as the teachers mm. providing the materials. We are aware, aren't we, also of the many who have lost jobs uh, and the financial restraints on many. And we're also aware of um, mental health issues. Mm. So just a thought, why don't you pray maybe once a day, six o'clock or another time? Mm -hmm. And you know, Rachel, I was thinking, one of the importance of, of what we're talking about is I'm going to suggest maybe we don't just do a national prayer per se, but the strength of prayer is when it's at grassroots level mm -hmm. in the community. And so let's be very specific. We are here, many of us are in Tunbridge Wells, you may be elsewhere. Why don't you be specific on the issues that I've raised, praying for specific schools, specific mm -hmm. children, teachers, uh, families, hospitals etc uh, at this time because prayer does make a difference mm -hmm. and you may if you're in a home with more than one generation do it as an intergenerational activity it's not the length of prayer it's uh, actually connecting with God mm -hmm. and believing that through prayers things can change and make a huge huge difference mm -hmm. yeah it can be very powerful a couple of other quick thoughts yeah Excellent. Go if, for it. if you haven't tried it, at 7.30 to 8.30 on a Friday, a, a, a group of folk come and pray. Mm -hmm. And at least half of it now is praying for the, this time through pandemic, and the other half is for local church. So if you'd like to join that, you will see it on our website. Come and join it. There's also a possibility. Once a week, out goes a lovely uh, prayer sheet of what to pray for and how to pray. If you would like to do that, uh, just uh, email office at twbc.org.uk. Come on, let's pray. Let's see God change things. Let's see our country, our neighbourhood, our families and homes come through this pandemic stronger and better and healthier. Absolutely. Your prayer makes a difference. Fantastic. And that's 7.30 till 8.30 a.m., not PM. Is that correct, In Duncan? the morning on a In Friday. In the morning. Yeah. Excellent. Very good. Brilliant. Now, our photos this week are pictures of all the things you've been up to. You've been sending lots in. So we've got a picture of Winston getting ready to watch church, which is very good. I love that one. Some of you actually made the most of the snow the few minutes that we had it last weekend. So some of you actually made snowballs. I was quite impressed by that. But because some of you weren't too impressed about the lack of snow, You've made up your own snowmen. That's very good. And I really liked Rue on his balance bike. Nice one, Rue. 
We're going to um, look at those pictures now, and then we're going to have the slides as well. They'll follow on um, saying what's happening this week. So all the children's activities um, and the young people's activities, the links will be there. Uh, do scroll down to find them. Um, and don't forget that on the 18th of February, that's a Thursday evening, we've got a one-off evening course, uh, which we're calling a Love Your Neighbour, which is looking at the unity and diversity for us in our current context. So it'd be really good for you to sign up. It'll be 8 p.m. till 10 p.m. on Zoom. So if you'd like to let Duncan know directly if you're able to come, it'd be really great to see you there. The Rachel. Oh, hello, Rachel. Hello. I tell you what, to make it even easier, they can go. Anyone can go onto the website, Very and good. it's done through Evenbrite. You just click in, sign up, and then we'll be able to send you the link. Okay. So do that, don't contact Duncan directly. I mean, I'm sure he'd like it, but obviously <laughs> follow the right way about that. That would be good. Okay, so let's see your pictures. We're all acutely aware of the, um, the mark that we've passed this week of 100,000 um, people who've died from COVID. Um, you know, it's happened in our country and it's a real sobering statistic, isn't it? But I think the most um, humbling and sobering part of it is the families and friends who have been impacted and those left behind. That is a huge, huge amount of people. And you know, for us as a church family, over just in this last month, we've lost uh, three of our more mature folk in our church family. Um, and we've had David, Cynthia, and Irene. And also, um, we've lost Peter as well, who has been, a, was part of our church family for quite some years. Now, if you put all of their total number of years in our church membership, it would make about 178 years. That's like an amazingly positive statistic, isn't it? We've also heard about Derek Hills passing away uh, this week. Um, he had a very brief but very difficult illness. So all of these folk have meant a lot to us. So it'd be really good to uh, just pray now, uh, giving thanks for them and praying for their families. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're constantly faced with the statistics of um, COVID 
And Lord, help us not to become numb to the figures that we see on our screens, but to remember and to bring before you those families and those friends, those who have lost loved ones. Father, we pray particularly for um, David, Cynthia's and Irene's family, and Peter's family too. They've been part of our church family for a very long time. Lord, we thank you for their love for you. Um, and Lord, we pray for Derek as well. We, Lord, we thank you for his life. Um, and Lord, for all of them. They loved you deeply. Uh, they loved working for your kingdom. And they loved all those around them. And Lord, we thank you for their lives. And Lord, we pray particularly for their families who are grieving mm -hmm. for them at this time, this very difficult mm -hmm. time. And of course, remember those um, who've also lost loved ones very recently. And Lord, may you bring your peace and bring your comfort. Um, Lord, these were such special folk who were light in your world. They pointed to you, Jesus. So Lord, as we remember them, will you enable us to be um, light in our world? And Lord, we thank you for them and we remember them now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm now going to hand over to Tayo, who's going to continue in our time of prayer. Good morning, everybody. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for yet another Sunday. We thank you for bringing us here today to your grace. We bring, thank you, Lord Jesus, that as we come together, we know you're here, Heavenly Father. We lift you up on high. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we bring to you, Lord, that all our fellow people out there that are victims or survivors of the Holocaust, Heavenly Father. We pray that you would give them peace, peace that surpasses all understanding, peace in their hearts, Lord Jesus. We want you to be with them, Heavenly Father, as they remember throughout this week, Lord Jesus that you be with them in the mighty name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, Lord Almighty, we pray for other countries in the world that things like this are happening, genocide in different shapes and forms, Heavenly Father. We pray that these atrocities will be lifted away in the mighty name of Jesus. We want you to be replaced with love, Heavenly Father. We want you to replace these things with love and love for one another, Heavenly Father. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you give us a spirit of tolerance, that we tolerate one another, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would melt our hearts and fill it with love instead of hatred, Heavenly Father. Fill it with love, Lord Jesus, instead of hatred, Heavenly Father. We pray, Lord Jesus, that all over the world, that hardened hearts will be made soft, Heavenly Father. Hardened hearts will be made soft in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray also for all the lives that have lost during COVID, Heavenly Father. Yet again, hit a, a gruesome, gruesome milestone at over 100K. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, all these families affected, that you continue to be with them and bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. You continue to fill that void, Heavenly Father, of the, of the loss of their loved ones. Heavenly Father, begin to keep them at peace, Heavenly Father. Console them, Lord Jesus. Console them, Heavenly Father. Console them, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, because this is beyond anybody's understanding. Heavenly Father, be with them. Be with them, Lord. Be with them, Lord, and, and make, make them whole in the mighty name of Jesus. It's affecting everybody, both at home, at church, and abroad, Heavenly Father. We pray that everyone who's been affected one way or another, Lord, that you would lift them up at this dark time. You would lift them up, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are, for who you are, Lord Jesus. We thank you for things that are happening, Lord. We thank you for the vaccines that are being rolled out. We thank you for the scientists behind them and all the, the officials, the doctors, the healthcare workers, everybody involved, Heavenly Father, the volunteers, just to help us to get to grips with this. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this opportunity. We thank you for the fast rolling out of this. We thank you that people that need to be vaccinated are vaccinated. People that are waiting have been consulted and they're waiting, Heavenly Father. We thank you that by the end of this, Lord Jesus, 
I know it's going to be hard, but we want to glorify your name because you're the King of Kings, because you're the Lord of Lords, because you're the I am that I am, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We also pray for those who have lost jobs, Heavenly Father. We pray, Lord Jesus, as companies and, and stores begin to close down, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would find a way to fill and feed these people, Heavenly Father. They are your children, Heavenly Father. You find a way to fill them up. You find a way to provide for their needs, Heavenly Father. You provide for their needs, Lord Jesus. We know that, Heavenly Father. Begin to uplift them in the mighty name of Jesus. Begin to show them the way to go, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. And at the end of it, Lord, however difficult this will be, we're going to come out and we're going to glorify your holy name. We're going to come out and we're going to glorify your holy name. Let your name be glorified, Lord Jesus. To you be the glory, Lord Jesus. To you be the glory, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Our Bible reading is taken today from Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 26. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. The Church in Antioch of Syria. The believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. When the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to say true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Thank you, Rachel. As you heard earlier, we're going to be looking at the whole area of encouragement this, today. I really want to just uh, affirm so many of you who are out there encouraging and really blessing those around you. There's such wonderful stories that are going on. And so I trust today you'll find it really helpful just to, to be affirmed and to continue in doing what you're doing and going on in it, especially at this difficult time. The word encouragement comes 105 times uh, in, in the New Testament. Uh, and the word in Greek is um, parakleo. And parakleo means coming alongside, coming alongside another person. In other words, not being in front of them, not being behind them, but that brotherly, sisterly, alongside, supporting the person you're next to. It's normally done in the context of the New Testament of teaching, or being of comfort, or strengthening them and encouraging them on to pursue uh, their Christian faith. It often is also used to encourage people to do the right thing, however difficult it is. Because have you noticed in the word of encourage, in the middle of it, it's the word courage. And actually what we're often doing is trying to give people and encourage them to be very courageous in the things that they believe they should be doing at this time. We want to help them to be strong and heartened and to spur them on and be an incentive. Let me just briefly say what it's not. Encouragement is really not primarily about platitudes and nice words per se. It's not about being superficial. It's also not, and this may surprise some of us, it's not aspiring people to learn to be themselves or to, to be themselves. Haven't we often heard it? Oh, the best thing you can do is 
is to find yourself and, and to be yourself. I, I hear that. And there's a part of me that has an aspect of empathy towards it. But if we're going to be strictly true to scriptures and to how the God has made us and created us, I would like to suggest that if we're very frankly honest with ourselves, not every part of us is actually brilliant. There's parts of me you really don't want to encourage. Some of you have had children or have children. I have a dog. And I'm certainly not going to encourage my dog in bad behavior. And so isn't it true with ourselves? There's some bad things that really we shouldn't be encouraging one another. Paul has a way of saying this. Writing to the church in Ephesus, he said this. Throw off your old sinful nature, that which is corrupted, and let the Spirit of God renew you. So therefore put on the new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And it's that new nature that we want to encourage. We want to encourage that gold within a person. Let me say it another way. Some of you know Mark 8.34 where it says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. One aspect of that denying is to deny, is to leave behind that which is sinful in ourselves and is not helpful and is destructive. Let's put that away and then let's encourage that spirit-filled life which is good and right. Let me illustrate it another way. If we say, well, let's encourage us being ourselves, it reminds me of like a plant. Have you ever noticed a plant when it comes out of the soil? What does it do? It looks up to the sun. And as the sun pours out its love on it, so it photosynthesizes and it grows and it has beautiful colors and it branches out. If it didn't look up to the sun and there was no sun, many of the plants would wither and die and they'd have an insipid color and go back into the soil. So that's exactly the way we've been created. It's interesting what the Word of God says. Jesus' greatest commandment was not be yourself. His greatest was commandment, uh, commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So you look up to God. And as you look up to God, your Creator, and the one who designed you and made you as you are, he then says, Look out, love your neighbor as yourself. And so as an encourager, we want to hear from God. And then as we hear from God, we want to therefore go out and look at other people. And as we look at other people, we want to find first, yeah, I'm going to have seven G's, gold in a person. I find it easy to have. And seven is a perfect number. I need to uh, say straight away, this is not a perfect number. It's an incomplete number. So you may have your own to add to this and, and have a more complete list. The other thing, as I go through the seven ways of, of, of encouraging others, you may find it helpful to think of a specific person or even a group of people that you would like to continue to encourage and to find a language and a way to encourage them. I find that really helpful to, to have pictures of people in my mind uh, when I prepared for this talk today. So think of that person or people and, and look at them and say, I want to find the gold in that person. Remember, we're not looking at the rubbish or that which is not good. We're not looking at the old nature. We're looking at the new nature. What is the gold, that nugget, that nugget that you, uh, you want to encourage to grow, it's priceless, it's eternally valuable. I would encourage that person. We do it with children, don't we? We encourage good behavior. We see parts of their being that are absolutely amazing. Let's encourage them to nurture it, to grow in it, to develop in it. If 
we say nothing, they are not going to be motivated as much as if we say something positive to help them in these areas. We all need encouragement. Of course, one of the greatest encouragers in, in the Bible is Barnabas. His name actually was Joseph. He was a Levite, we read in Acts 4, 36. He came from Cyprus, where the apostles called him Barnabas. Barnabas means sons of encouragement. I guess it says something about his character and his ability to discern situations and then bring in encouragement. The first thing he did was he sold the field. He owned and bought the money, brought the money and gave it to the apostles to use for the kingdom of God and for God's purposes. And so what we see there is what Paul Barnabas did as an encouragement is he gave financially to God's work. Maybe sometimes God asks you and me to be an encouragement, a blessing to an individual, to a church, to an organization, to a situation. And one way of doing it is financially. Remember I'm talking about seven but this is one. And we're, we're talking about being open to the Spirit of God to hear from him how we can encourage. Needless to say, encouraging others can be really costly. If we move from chapter 4, let's go into chapter 9. We have that amazing uh, conversion of Saul. Uh, Saul was one of the chief uh, persecutors of the Christians. He was in Damascus to find Christians and throw them in prison and to ostracize them and to persecute them. And then on the way there, he had an incredibly bright light and a voice came from the bright light and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he was shaking in his boot on the ground. Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Wow. This persecutor met with Jesus on the road to Damascus. But then there was a person called Ananias who heard from God. And God said to him, get ready and go straight street to the house of Judas and ask the man from Tarsus uh, to speak to Saul. Yes, go. This man, Saul, is chosen by me to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their king to the people of Israel. Ananias was an encourager there. He used his prophetic gift that God gave him to speak into the situation. He was, so Saul was called prophetically at this time. And of course, and Saul had this incredible conversion. Uh, he, he lost his sight for three days. He had new sight. And that symbolized also his heart. His heart was changed. He was now a follower of Jesus. And from persecuting, he was promoting Jesus. And he was proclaiming the message. He was healing people. He was uh, praying for people. And absolute transformation overnight. So much so that the Jewish people were terrified of him and wanted to kill him that he fled back to Jerusalem. And I just love Saul. I can just imagine him who became Paul. He goes back in Jerusalem and says, Hello, Christians. I used to persecute you, but now look at me. I've, I'm filled with the Spirit of God. I want to be one with you. All of them were absolutely petrified. Do remember, Saul was instigational in the death of Stephen when he was stoned. I'd like to suggest this. Barnabas, who came alongside the Paraclesa, came alongside Paul, spoke to the apostles, and basically discerned that this conversion was real, that the Spirit of God had come upon him, he was a changed person, and we need to now trust him because God trusts him. And so the third thing, if we're going to encourage people, we do need to have great discernment. We need to see people who have been changed and we need to see when uh, we need to give people a second chance. 
Let us not be filled with prejudice or continuing to think of people as bad people when they've changed and they've uh, been renewed and when they've been transformed. Let's be like Barnabas. Let's not only have great discernment, let's have a generous spirit to people. Let's give people sometimes the benefit of the doubt with it. The world is changing. People are changing. As we encourage people to be gold, as we encourage people to change and to grow and to become more like Christ, let's get behind them. Let's support them. They will still make mistakes. They will still get things wrong. Children make mistakes. But let's, let's allow them to be picked up and then to go again. And then let's keep encouraging them. I think you made a really good decision. And you and I need to make good decisions of who we encourage. Where we see gold, let's encourage it. That's a really good decision. We'll know if we're right by the fruit. You'll see that person grow. Sometimes they physically grow as you speak to them because they know your words aren't just ordinary words. You've been led by the Spirit of God and there's even more power behind the words. Not because of the volume, but because of what's been deposited in their spirit. And I just love it. Then Barnabas uh, was sent to a church in Antioch because he had discernment, a great discernment with this generous spirit and could see gold, and he was trusted by the apostles. He was sent to Antioch to see what was going on there. Antioch was the first church in the world that became multicultural, multinational. Up until then, it had been Aramaic-speaking Jews who came to faith, or Greek-speaking Jews who came to faith. Paul had now been given a word from God to go to the Gentiles, and now there was a church in Antioch full of Gentiles, people from different ethnic backgrounds, and so forth. What I'm encouraged by that, in a time of crisis, which they were with all the persecution, God did something new. The church of Antioch is, a, Antioch is a wonderful example of a multicultural, multiracial church that will function differently. I would even suggest, and you can read the Bible for yourself, but my understanding, it actually supplanted the church in Jerusalem. Because my reading of it, Jerusalem continued to struggle to embrace those from other cultures and backgrounds and their role diminished. There still will always be the mother church, and there's still a church there today, and they still have a significant role in the kingdom of God. But actually, it was taken over by Antioch at that time, because God was doing a new thing. And I would like to suggest in this time of the pandemic, there's so much difficulty, so much crisis going on. God is doing a new thing, and we want to hear, and we want to encourage it. We want to be part of it. God is doing a new thing in many of our lives. Many of us are being changed and transformed through this difficult time. We're hearing more from God. We're seeking to obey him more. We're stepping out in faith. We are stepping out into the things of God. And we want to be a part of that. So let's encourage one another in it, shall we? Sixthly, let's be a grace-filled people with a grace-filled message. We want to encourage people to be gold. We want to encourage and have discernment to see where people have fallen, have got up and are going again. We want to do things new. But we also need to have a grace-filled message. Can I just say, it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. But let's talk about the what. There's two things that we can encourage people we encourage our families, our friends, our neighbours. One is the message of salvation, the good news. In this difficult time, as we heard right at the beginning of the service, where it was difficult in Thessalonica, they love to hear the message of God. That message where God wants to be reconciled and joined to the people on earth. He wants to be reconciled. He wants to be one with people. We are in a terrible situation or pandemic. Let us be these people who have this wonderful good news to share. 
You can be reconciled with God. You can be joined to God. You can be filled with the Spirit. You can be at one with Him. And as you're one with Him, then you can be one with your neighbors. So the first thing is, let's be sharers of the good news. In that reading, uh, chapter 14, 15, let's turning from worthless and turning to the living God. But Barnabas and Paul don't stop there. They said, then let's keep on, in verse 43, living in the grace of God. It's not enough to be saved. We need to be, there's a huge word, sanctified. We need to grow in our spirituality and grow in our faith in the Lord. Grow. Isn't it interesting? Both Stephen and last week and Barnabas had two things. They were filled with the Spirit of God. And secondly, they were people of faith. And so we need to pray that people will be filled with the Spirit of God, but they will be people of faith. And like Paul and Barnabas in chapter 14, strengthening and encouraging one another. And so lastly, number seven, let's be grounded in the Word of God. As the Spirit of God dwells in us, May the word of God dwell in us. For the scripture gives us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled in Romans 15 verse 4. And may God, who is, this, is the source, give you and I patience and encouragement and help to live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Jesus Christ. So may the Spirit of God dwell in you as an encourager. May the Word of God dwell in you. May you be filled with the Spirit. And may that Word which dwells in you come out of your mouth and be words of encouragement to others to grow and to, to mature into the things God has for them. We are encouraged in Romans 1.12 to mutually encourage each other in the faith. Or 1 Thessalonians 5.11, to encourage and to build each other up in the faith. So, what are the seven? I've got, you've probably got eight, nine, ten, eleven ways of encouraging. Mine are, let's recognize the gold in a person and let's call it out of them. Whether it's a child, an adult, neighbor, friend, family. Let's give ourselves to the benefit of others. We gave in a financial, but there's many ways. Some are doing it through the community larder. Some are giving their time, their expertise. But let's give of ourselves to the benefit of others, which will encourage them. And let's have that Holy Spirit discernment, that great discernment. Let us be generous and open-spirited to one another so that we can make good decisions with grace-filled messages grounded in the Word of God. And in conclusion, I've talked an awful lot about being an encourager, but may you receive and be willing and open to receive encouragement. If you have spirit-filled friends, if you have people who are really wanting the best for you, and they've got wonderful words of encouragement, can you be vulnerable enough to be open to receive it and to accept it and to allow that word to dwell within you? I don't know about you, but so often we brush off the words or we, we, we just can't cope and we get all anxious or we ignore them. But maybe God is saying to you today, I want you to be encouraged. You are a beautiful woman. You are a beautiful daughter or son of the king. You have the spirit of God in you. And you have beautiful qualities and characters that he wants to, to grow in you, that beautiful gold in you. But you've got to receive that as an affirmation and to receive it and to grow in it and to become the man or woman that God's called you to be. Through that, you will be able to get through this pandemic and come out stronger the other end and be transformed by the living God. God bless you in that.
May our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father who loves us and by his grace gives us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. God bless you. and May you experience God's love, protection and help in the power of his Holy Spirit in the coming days.